Those European types love these great big enduro style bikes like the Africa Twin. It is actually a known fact that 9 out of 10 Germans have at some point or another leapt on one of these, bolted on those narrow metal panniers to the back and buggered off around the world. So there must be something right about them. But I've avoided trying one until now for one very good reason. <laughs> it's this bit of a problem. But it's not that bad. If you are like me, built more for compactness than anything else, once you're on board, those long, soft off-road springs compress and bring the ground almost within reach. And once you're rolling, well, it's really not a problem. The Honda Africa Twin 750 has been around for a few years now, so you could say it's getting a bit long in the tooth, or you could say it's a classic. Either way, it's certainly not changed much over the years. What you're not buying with an Africa Twin is a sophisticated machine loaded with cutting-edge technology. They're built and designed to look rugged, and in fact, they are rugged. So that's exactly what you get, a simple, solid machine, that long-travel, off-road-ish suspension front and back. The wheels with those tyres that look off-road, but uh, those are road tyres, they're not fooling anybody. Then you get a simple frame, cradling a simple V-twin 750cc engine that shares components with a dozen other 750s in the Honda range. On board, well, obviously, You've got these huge broad handlebars, you're sitting almost bolt upright, and in front of you is a dash layout that, um, I don't know if it's a layout, it's a throwout really. Certainly nothing like a sports tour of bits and pieces clustered about all over the place. But it's got everything you need. You're not riding a tourer, you're riding a roughly tufty enduro. But what's really amazing is what a good tourer it makes. That riding position is so comfortable for long journeys. Bolt upright, arms out wide, legs straight down below. Believe me, it's comfy. Now, of course, you'd have to be mad to attempt the Paris-Dakar on something like this. It is very much more a styling exercise after off-road rather than romping across hill and dale. But that long travel suspension means it irons out even the roughest of potholes. It's silky smooth. Anybody who's ever spent any time on this or even many other bikes in the same category will tell you what's also amazing is how well it goes around corners. The suspension compresses, it soaks up the bumps and it'll grip and grip and grip. You can get some serious lean on if you so choose. Mind you, it's quite a long way down. Some things I really don't get. Most computer games, those stupid little mini scooters, bikes with CD players, I don't get any of those. This, I actually do get. It might seem a really odd idea to go touring and use every day a bike that's styled to look like something you'd cross the desert on, but it actually makes a surprising amount of sense. That riding position, upright with your arms widely spaced, is hugely comfortable. Those great dollops of torque from that simple V-twin mean it is actually a delight to ride without feeling you've got to go at breakneck speed everywhere. And they're cheap best of all. This R-plated example with about 17,000 miles on the clock, you'd pick up for four, four and a half thousand pounds and you could get one for less. Remember, there's no need to buy desperately new with something like this. They're very long lived. So cheap, practical and durable. Maybe the Germans had it right after all. You know, if you open a motorcycle magazine, <coughs> go and buy any motorcycle mag and have a look down the bike listings, the names of the bikes, the makers and the models, in particular the models, Every month we seem to be getting new models, new names, and you think, oh, how on earth am I going to remember all this lot? They're coming out all the time. But also, if you look closely, you'll see names that seem to have been there for years, for donkey's years. This is one such name, this name here, Honda Transalp, yeah. Been around for ages, actually been around since 1987, can you believe, all that time. So they must have been doing something right, but it's grown up a little bit since then, back in 87. The Transalp was a 600cc V-twin motor. Well, it's still a V-twin, but it's grown up now to a 650cc. Well, actually, 649cc, I think it is. But there it is, still a V-twin, and it's the same engine as Honda used in the Deauville. And that's got a good reputation, and that's become a bit of a favourite with motorcycle couriers. And they like machines, or they like engines, that are good for many tens of thousands of miles up and down the country all day long, seven days a week, some of them. So there won't be very much wrong with the motor. But it's not just grown up engine-wise, it's grown up, I think, in its looks, because it's still essentially an off-road looking machine, off-road style of bike. But I think it's becoming a little bit more road bike in its looks, in its bodywork. It's a bit more sort of streamlined now, shall we say, the way these indicators are all thrust into the fern. Oh, very, very smart. Perhaps lost that little bit of a rugged look that it had in its early days. And one other thing that you need to be careful of, I'll just show you this, watch this. People with short legs, should beware, because this is a very, very tall machine. But 
but that can be a good thing because sitting this high gives you a great view of the road ahead. The Transel isn't fast, it's not meant to be. It's got a nice, friendly sort of power delivery, just about right for this style of bike. It really is an easy bike to ride, there's no nasty twitches, everything's just very predictable and very sure-footed. It's more at home on the tarmac, but it won't complain too much on the odd muddy track. Suspension setup as standard is a bit too soft for any serious terrain, but you certainly wouldn't get away with this on your race replica. So while we're on the off-road theme, <laughs> let's have a look at the off-road bits and pieces on the Transalp. Well, the most obvious one is down there, bottom of the engine. Have a look at that. How's that for a sump guard, eh? Massive, huge, big bash plate on the bottom there, so that'll protect the bottom of the engine should you choose to do any off-roading over rocks and boulders and things like that. And also it'll protect the downpipe for the exhaust as well because the front cylinder comes right down there, right behind that. So that's all protected nicely. Then the exhaust along up here. Any off-road bike, any decent off-road bike has the exhaust up there, tucked up high, out of the way, out of harm's way where it can't get bashed and wrecked. And while we're on the back end here, nice big rack there, look at that. Big solid thing there, you could stick a top box on there, fill it up, you could strap luggage to it, you could do anything you like really. And somewhere nice and easy for your pillion to hang on to. And I've been riding this two up, I had a pillion on the back quite a bit, quite a few times. And it's nice with a pillion on the back, it's quite easy to ride, it doesn't upset the handling of it. And it's quite comfy for the pillion because the seat is pretty good. But if you don't like the seat, you can take it off. Wouldn't be much use if you took it off, would it? But there you go, it comes off like that. And there's not much to see under there. Big hole there, you could probably get a packet of crisps and a toothbrush in it, but, uh, but little else. So let's put that back on out of the way. Up here on the dashboard, come and have a look up here. There's nothing too fancy about it, but it just looks nice. It's full of rain at the moment, of course, but it's nice and classy. It's well finished, it's well done, it's nicely put together. And over here, the left hand side, my favourite, I'm always moaning about it, fuel gauge. We've got a fuel gauge. We like bikes with fuel gauges. But going on the off road thing, still on the off road theme, we've got these over here on the top of the bars. One on each side, of course, these knuckle guards, hand guards. Stop you bashing your fingers as you're going down the dirt track, stop all the branches bashing your fingers. But I suspect that most people who own a Transalp won't go on the dirt tracks because, let's face it, the off-road ability of this is, shall we say, somewhat limited. But these are actually great for keeping your hands warm. Because when you get cold fingers, when you're riding a bike, the things that make your hand cold is the wind. It's the wind chill that makes your knuckles freeze and makes your fingers freeze up. Well, them help to sort of stop the wind blowing on your hands. So they do keep your hands quite warm. So very useful, even on a road bike. Doesn't have to be an off-road bike. But so I'll tell you what it hasn't got, and I hate it, I hate for saying this, it hasn't got a centre stand. And you know what really annoys me about it? Is that underneath there are the holes for the spindle for the centre stand. So it's all there. It just needs the stand put it on it. But they don't do it. You don't get it. But you can have it, but you'll have to pay extra for it. I don't know. That's just one of my, uh, one of my pet hates. But I'll tell you the best thing about this bike, the very, very best thing, and that's its comfort, the riding position, because it's so, so comfy. And if you've got a bad back, perfect. If you've got a bad back, this is the style of machine that you need because really you could sit here all day long. You know, I can't begin to tell you just how comfy this bike is. Cutting through busy rush hour traffic is easy. The bike's nice and light and it's all very manoeuvrable. Now it may have been around for some time, but this new Transalp, or the XL650V to give it the full title, certainly doesn't feel or look dated and on the road, it'll cost you £5,400. And here it is, was it? Honda's CB1300. Do you know very much about these? Well, Honda have been trying to get in on the muscle bike market for a long time, haven't they? We, they have. we go back a few years, the CB1. Yeah, CBX, the big massive six cylinder. That worked, didn't it? Yeah, well that was great. Yeah. They're trying to build on that heritage. CB1 came first, then they got the Blackbird motor, went off on a tangent, gave us the X11. That's right. Neither yeah. really found favour. Well, they reckon this is, uh, is, it might just do the trick for them. It looks right, doesn't it? Mm. It's not a semi retro, nice red and white colour scheme. It's a Honda, so it's going to be okay, we think. Just but, hope it's got a bit of aggression. Well, eh? 30 points to beat, eh? Hey, let's give it a go. The 
The CB1300 is Honda's newest old bike, if you care to see what I mean, with a heavy growling engine and 107 brake horsepower encased in a heavy 80s style bike. Honda seem to have developed an uncanny knack over the years for producing bikes that do their job with so little fuss that we almost take them for granted now. Well, guess what? They've gone and done it again with the new CB1300. Lots of four-cylinder machines need to hit somewhere around 6,000 RPM before anything exciting starts to happen. This CB1300 develops its peak power at a low leap 5,800 RPM and it will pull cleanly in just about any gear from as little as 1,500 RPM. Make no mistake, this bike is big and it's heavy, but it's not intimidating in any way. In fact, it's easy to ride and it handles really well. And since riding it, I've been avoiding motorways and fast A roads in favour of more challenging B roads. And it's not very often you'd say that about something which weighs 240 kilos and has 1,300 cc's. The gearbox is typical Honda, super slick with no hints of any false neutrals. The steering is more than sharp enough to have some real fun on the twisties, although the suspension could be a touch on the soft side for any serious boy racer types. Looks wise, this is not quite as retro as some of the other bikes in this class, but it has a kind of pleasant mix of new and old styling. As I said before, this is no sports bike, but I'm sure that in the right hands, this could certainly teach the boy racers a thing or two. And it's not slow either, with a top speed close to 140 miles an hour. So it's over to the scoreboard on Honda's CB1300. Styling, seven out of 10. That engine just doesn't look retro enough. Performance, 8 out of 10, a fantastic motor that pulls cleanly from very low revs. Practicality, 8 out of 10, very, very comfortable, and you could ride this every day of the week. Value, 7 out of 10, it's not quite the cheapest in this class. So, how does it compare to the GSX? Well, I would say it's probably a better bike to throw around. You could mm. probably have a bit more fun on this. Surprising given how big it looks, isn't it? Yeah, but as I said before, it's not intimidating. It handles really well, very, very smooth. Loads of power down at the bottom end, which is great. A very low revving, like most of them are. But there's just a problem with the, the style of it with me. Now, it's, you're saying it's not looking old enough, don't you? That's what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. And, and what, why is that? Well, what I'm saying is these bikes are retro. Make no mistake, they're made to look like 70s muscle bikes, but that engine... Oh, oh I hadn't noticed I that. I mean, it's just a great big brand new lump of metal. I mean, put some cooling fins on it, put some dummy spark plugs on it if you want. Yeah. But if you're going to make a retro bike, go the whole hog. Give us a finned engine as well, give even, us a even if it's not air cool. Even if it's not air cool, make it look it. Mm. So that's 30 points, it's neck and neck with the GSX. Yeah, so, uh, but not all is lost because there's two more bikes still to play with, isn't Indeed there? Indeed there are. There are two more bikes left to come, as Paul has said. That's going to be in part two because this is the end of part one. Join us after the break when we'll be meeting Kawasaki's ZRX and Yamaha's XJR. We'll see you in a minute. Right, bad gag time. You're going to need some matches. Chuck us yours. Thank you. You need two of them. Sit down. So, two matches. One between your knees like that. Put the other one on the top like that. And go like that. Now you know what it feels like to be an elephant riding a scooter, or a fully grown adult riding a Sports 400. Such as this. Oh, It's actually the VFR 400R, the NC30 from Honda. It was the first of the proper Sports 400s to hit these shores back in the very beginning of the 90s, maybe the very last year or so of the 80s. It was really pretty exclusive and expensive then, since which there's been loads of 400s launched. They actually brought this one in officially, then they went grey, then there's a whole load of grey imports. This, though, is probably still the only one that has a V4 engine. It's huge fun, and we're going to play on it. <laughs> I feel huge. It makes you feel like Monster Man. I feel like John Wayne climbing onto a little tiny pony. And just like a proper little sports bike, you need to give it a really big handful of revs to move off from the start. Mind you, first gear is pretty tall, and once you've cleared that, the rest is easy. There's no doubt in that it's small, but it's only when you ride it do you realise how short it is. The front of the bike kind of disappears from below your field of view. You really are sat right over the front wheel. Now, it may have been small, 
but they packed a lot into the VFR 400R. For a start, there is that V4 engine, a little 400 baby VFR engine, obviously, which gives it that lovely note and that huge amount of torque in the bottom range for what is a small engine. Then we had little radical tricks, like the single-sided swinging arm, which on any bike was pretty rare then, and on something this tiny, it was incredible. There's a really lovely alley frame, which is definitely worth a quick look. And then, of course, that proper race bike geometry, so you're right over the front wheel. All in all, it was pretty advanced. There was nothing else like it, certainly on the UK roads at the time. But above all else, it was and is about attitude, because when you climb on board, you've got to assume the position, buster, with those rear sets, your head down, those low, low clip-on bars here at the front. Incredible braking. The size of the brakes on this thing would stop something three times its weight, no problem. The stripped out, almost naked cockpit up here, a real racer feel to it. And that's really what the whole 400 thing is all about, and that's why I like the idea of them, because there's something slightly naughty about it, a bit like having your first fag when you're perhaps a bit under 16. This bike clearly has no purpose other than going fast. There's nothing sensible or compromised about it. You can't tour. God knows you wouldn't want to sit on the back of the thing and there's nowhere to put luggage. Even to the point of if you've gone to the trouble of fitting a single-sided swinging arm at the back, why root the exhaust in front of it? Put it the other side. Let the world see. This is a racing bike for racers. Small racers, obviously. This particular bike hadn't yet been prepared for sale, and so it had a rather wobbly headstock, due, I suspect, to a dodgy bearing and a very squared-off rear tyre, which made cornering a bit of an adventure. Nevertheless, the VFR's handling does shine through. There's no doubt that it is extremely flickable. It'll change direction quicker than you can plan it. The 400 sports bike class only exists at all because in Japan you have to take another test to ride a bigger bike. Therefore, they've squeezed every last iota of power from the 400 engine. Dealers over here soon realised that there was a bit of a market, and so the grey imports caught up, and eventually Honda stopped bringing the VFR in as an official import at all. Now, of course, there's a whole raft of 400s available. It might be a pocket rocket, but don't expect it to be that light on your wallet. This example on a J-plate, once all its little niggles have been put right, will set you back at a dealer the best part of three grand. You'll get it for less if you're really brutal with your dealer. And what could be better on the right day than getting out on a 400? OK, any Sport 600 is probably going to beat it, but not in the hands of most of us. And with the VFR 400, you're also getting that rare thing in such a fast and frantic class. That's a bike with not only that extra torque from the V4, but also a little bit of heritage and pedigree. Permit me to explain. No, I haven't taken up rodeo riding, and no, it's not the Chalfonts flaring up again either. It all happened in the line of duty. I was sent to test ride the Honda Valkyrie, and, well, see for yourself. Wow! <laughs> it is huge! I mean, massive! Not just a big bike, it is enormous. It's actually the Honda Valkyrie, or F6C, standing to Flat 6 Custom, to give it its proper name. And it is massive, and it's got real visual impact in the same way that a docking ship grabs your attention at the quayside. And it's not just the length of the thing either, it's the gaff. Six horizontally opposed cylinders do not make for a lean and narrow steel. In fact, the only bike I can remember being close to this wide was the old CBX with six transversely mounted pots. But even that looks like a moped next to this. It really is born to be wide. It shares that 1500cc engine with the equally gigantic Goldwing, where it can at least be justified on the grounds of providing effortless long-distance cruising. Here, though, there's absolutely no excuse for it whatsoever, and that is the point, I think. Oh, and incidentally, it costs £10,500 and weighs as much as a fireblade, with two scooters strapped to it. It's like riding a Highland cow. Mind you, it actually feels perfectly manageable once it's rolling, despite the immense size. It's unbelievably smooth without being soggy and wallowy. Many customs half its size could learn a lot about handling here. Of course, it's probably not the suspension soaking up the bikes, so much as the weight steamrolling them flat. The shy and retiring had better think twice before throwing a leg over the Valkyrie, because subtle it ain't. On the motorway, people get out of your way as you come thundering up behind them, either to take a good look, or probably because they're worried you might not be able to stop. In town, well, either get a tinted visor or wear a gorilla mask if you don't want to be recognised. I did both, obviously. So, let's put it to the test and see what happens. 
I'll have a lolly, please, mate. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you in a minute. One potential problem, though, is that even if you're just a big show-off and love to be noticed, it attracts attention from all the wrong people. It's a bit too, well, granny-friendly. Know what I mean? Ooh, isn't it lovely? Isn't it gorgeous? Just watch. Go on, look at the bike. Go on, go on. Look, it's all shiny. Look at the bike! Have you got no heart? Look, big shiny bike! Ooh, people. See what I mean? Yeah, well, not everything works, but there are some gorgeous details on the bike. For a start, there's the engine itself, and not just the finishing on it, the sheer size and presence of it. Looks as though the whole bike has been lowered down onto that and this beautiful twisty exhaust system. Then we've got the tank, huge, and the seat. How many buttocks do they think I'm going to get on there? They've really gone for that American flavour there, obviously. We've got a beautiful, comfy pillion setup, which is most welcome, and then gorgeous details like the clocks superbly finished and the headlamp with that little hooded bit over the top with the enormous mud guards and oh i could go on but i won't just have a look the other thing the f6c does very well indeed is dispel one of the usual problems associated with big shiny customs and that's when you get oh mate doesn't that look great oh but it's really fast isn't it when actually despite having twice the capacity of their nissan micra it'll only go half as fast well not this time grandma because this goes like stink Mind you, it does get a bit breezy, particularly at high speeds, and it can hit very high speeds. Up to about, well, 100 miles an hour, it threatens to leave you behind. Over that, you know, 110, and something rather odd happens with the aerodynamics, so that it's actually easier to hang on. I'd say that a screen might be a good add-on, even if it is a bit wimpy and gives it all the aerodynamics of a barn door. And while you're at it, you might as well stick some luggage on the back, and you'd have a very capable, and let's face it, good-looking, long-distance cruiser. Now, look at it this way. If I have to explain why the Valkyrie, then you'll never understand. Of course it's ridiculous if you look at it with your accountant's head on, but then it's precisely accountants, doctors, lawyers, frustrated middle management who'll be buying these things because they're ridiculous, because they make no sense. Let's face it, unless you're a dispatch rider, it seldom makes much sense to own a bike in this country anyway. They're expensive and it never stops raining. And I'll tell you something else. I want one. I, uh, I want one. All right, I want one. I love it. Think of performance twins and you'll instantly think of Ducati. In fact, it's true to say that it's only in the last few years that the Japanese have started to get a decent foothold in this particular market. Honda, of course, are now enjoying some racing success with their SP1, but more common on the road is their VTR Firestorm. And for 2001, they've made a few changes to the big twin. And here it is, this is the new 2001 model Honda VTR, the Firestorm. A few subtle changes, a few slight cosmetic changes, but not really very much, but uh, quite a few engineering changes on this 2001 model. Still very, very distinctive, still got this frame that we're all used to seeing now on a Firestorm. What would you call it? It's kind of a bit trellis, sort of a bit beam type frame. It's a bit of a mixture of styles really, but still very, very distinctive, still very, very Honda Firestorm. V-twin motor in there, of course, 90 degree V-twin. Still got the side mounted radiators here, one either side. So normally you'd look up the front of the bike there behind the wheel, you see a radiator. You don't on this one, you just see a whacking big cylinder sticking out forwards there. But the engine really just hangs from this frame. If you just if you look at the bike and think, well, how has this been put together? The engine just hangs from the frame. It's mounted here, 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 and a couple of other places as well, and it just literally just hangs off the bottom of the frame. Swinging arm is bolted to the back of the engine, straight onto the engine. So I think if you took the engine out of this, the whole thing would just fall to pieces. It'd just fall apart because really that's holding everything in place. One of the changes they've made on this is at the rear shock there. Not actually changed the shock, but they've now added rebound damping. It's uh, been added to the array of adjustments on the rear end there. So a little bit of a modification there. Also the ignition and the carburation settings have been modified slightly to give, so they say, a smoother power delivery. Still got carburetors on this, look, manual choke there, on the side there, which is a bit awkward to find with a glove hand until you actually get used to where it is, but uh, there it is. We've not gone fuel injected yet, you'd have thought they might have done that on the latest model, but no carburetors we've got. Up here, the handlebars, believe it or not, are different. 
well they're not different they're just higher slightly higher up so they say it gives a more comfortable riding position now on this new version of it and it is quite comfy actually the seat's not bad a couple of hours two or three hours in the saddle no problem at all also the fuel tank has grown up this is now a 19 litre fuel tank on this version and I know Firestorms have never been famous for their uh, sort of touring range, you might say. They've never been famous for their uh, economy. And let me tell you that I filled this up a few days ago, right to the top, and then I did fairly sustained high-speed sort of travelling on the motorways at quite high speeds, and I got 120 miles before the low fuel light started to flash. Well, that's not good, if you ask me. I don't think that's great. OK, I didn't run out of fuel. But the light was flashing, so after 120 miles, I was starting to look around for fuel. So uh, probably not quite addressed that uh, that problem just yet. But it is a comfy bike, as I say. You can sit on it a long time and enjoy the big throbbing V-twin motor because it does throb. Because that's what V-twins do. They have character. People say twins have character. Well, character to me is just another word for vibration. They do vibrate by their very nature. They shake a lot. And I have to say that when I first climbed aboard this, for the first 40 or 50 miles or so, I hated every minute of it. Perhaps I was judging things a little bit too quickly. Yes, I did hate it at first, but after what, three or 400 miles or so, I started to slip into the groove, as they say. I really think it's a case of what you've been used to. If you've served your time on four-cylinder machines, then you'll probably hate the twins. There again, if you've been brought up with twins, you'll probably love the new Firestorm. It is slightly lumpy at low revs, and it likes to be spent at somewhere around 3,500 revs before things start to smooth out. And it doesn't go completely smooth until you hit 4,000 revs, by which time, in top gear, you're doing 75 miles an hour. And although it might be great fun, you can't travel everywhere at that kind of speed. And that's the problem, you see. This is a bike that likes to be worked hard. It likes to go fast. I think it'd be brilliant on a racetrack. Not actually had a chance to get it on a track this week, but uh, I think it'd be a fantastic track bike. But it doesn't like cities. It doesn't like traffic. It tends to chug a bit when it's, uh, when it's revving very low, or when it's in a low gear. Uh, which is, I don't like it to be honest with you. But I'll show you something else that they've changed. This dashboard up here, this is all different. Got a little digital display over there which gives you all the usual. We're all used to that now. Sort of temperature, there's a couple of trips, mileometer uh, fuel there as well. But this, let me show you this. I don't like this. They've got a big rev counter in the middle, fine. But then the speedo here, just look at the size of those numbers. Very, very difficult to read. And also the sort of strange thing is, if you look where zero miles an hour is, if you imagine that's a clock face, it's at kind of 20 past, isn't it? So which means that when the, uh, the needle is at half past, if you like, you're doing 55 miles an hour. When you glance down and you see the needle pointing straight down, it just looks weird. You expect it to be sort of starting to rise at 50 miles an hour. Uh, I just think it's odd. And especially when you think of other Honda bikes like the CBR 600, that's got a big speedo on it, which is digital. And it, you look down at a glance, it's dead easy to read, so Honda obviously think it's important to be able to read the speed. Uh, then they go and stick this on the Firestorm. I mean, why that speedo isn't in the middle, I don't know. It should be, if you ask me, because it's the speedo that's going to save your licence, save the points at the end of the day. But there you go. So I don't like that. Very sorry about that. You may have noticed this is a single seat version there. It's not actually a single seat because behind that little uh, seat cover at the back, that seat cowl, the seat does actually continue. It's a one piece seat. So you can take that off and you can have a pillion on the back. Where on earth they're going to hold on to, I don't know, but you can do that. And I would show you if I could get it off. Well, I can get it off, actually, but it's awkward. It's the usual thing, keying at the back, unlatch it. It says in the handbook, simply pull the centre of the seat, slide back and unlatch it, and it comes off. Well, it doesn't, actually. Well, not on this one, it doesn't, anyway. Uh, I just uh, had all sorts of problems getting the seat. One of the most awkward seats I've ever had to deal with. So uh, I'm not even going to attempt it on this occasion. Uh, so there's a few negative things. Sounds like I've got a bit of a downer on this, doesn't it? Well, it's about time we said something positive, isn't it, eh? I think so. OK, here goes then. It handles superbly. Steering is sharp, but it's not twitchy. It's also deceptively fast, and because it's a twin, it doesn't howl like a four-cylinder machine, and the engine never sounds like it's being worked hard. In fact, it's easy to find yourself doing 80 or 90 miles an hour before you know it. If you're a bit of a speed merchant, then you'll have great fun on the new Firestorm. I did have a little play with the suspension setting, but I can honestly say that for most situations during everyday riding, 
the standard factory settings seemed to work the best. Over the two weeks that I had the new model, I found myself wanting to ride it more and more. The combination of a torquey motor and sharp handling quickly becomes very addictive. So it's really a case of horses for courses. It is with any new bike these days, and if you're buying a new machine, you need to have a good look at it, have a ride on it, have a good read about it, find out what it's good at, and think, does that fit my particular usage? If you're into performance and handling, then you won't go far wrong with this. The new Firestorm comes in three colours now. This one, nice racy red colour, comes in a bright yellow, and it comes in a rather classy-looking metallic blue. And if you'd like to put one on the road, it'll cost you £7,449. And if you like V-Twins, I'm not a great fan myself, but if you like V-Twins and all the little idiosyncrasies that go with them, then, to be quite honest, you won't go far wrong with this. You know, sometimes a manufacturer brings out a new model, new model of motorcycle that somehow disappoints everybody. It's not quite what we expected. It doesn't quite look the way we thought it would. Well, that was my opinion when Honda brought out their last CBR600. Remember that one, the one with the big vacuum cleaner pipes on the front? Didn't quite look right to me. It looked a bit bland, a bit boring, wasn't aggressive enough, wasn't quite sporty enough, although there's no question that it all worked perfectly well. Well, imagine my delight when I first clapped eyes on this, the brand new 2001 CBR600. Honda haven't just improved the looks of the new CBR, they've actually now made it available in two versions. This is the CBR600F, and there's also a sportier looking version called the CBR600FS. It's certainly every bit as comfortable as previous models, but like all other middleweight sports bikes, it is slightly lacking in bottom end grunt. But hey, hit six and a half thousand revs, and it really comes alive. You know, I've always said that the single most important thing when you're choosing a new bike is, do you like what it looks like? It doesn't matter how good it's supposed to be, you can read all the test reports, it can be the best bike in the world. If you think it looks ugly, you ain't gonna buy it, simple as that. Well, I think the new CBR600 scores about 10 out of 10 in the looks department. It just looks fantastic to me. It's sleek, it's streamlined, it's aggressive now, it looks sporty, it definitely looks like a flying machine. The first thing you'll notice about the new CBR is the shape of it. Different shape. The front end, for example, the most obvious part of any bike. It's different, isn't it? It's pointy now. Look, we've got a big V shape there, twin headlamps. Very, very aggressive styling. Certainly a bit of Kawasaki in there, and there's a bit of Yamaha. In fact, there's a bit of lots of different sports bikes in there. And it all works very well. Looks really nice and aggressive. Look at this now. We've got big air intakes here. No Hoover pipes, big vacuum pipes we had sticking out there on the other model, which looked awful. But we've got these now. Big super duper air intakes. Front mud guard, that's different. It's bigger than before, it's more streamlined, it covers more of the bottom of the forks, more of the wheel itself, all to do with aerodynamics. And there's lots of subtle little changes in this that you, you'll never know, not unless you took the damn thing apart anyway. In here, the fork internals, they're different. They're now aluminium. They were steel before, so they're a bit lighter. And even details such as the calipers, the little Nissan calipers there, the pistons in them, they're now aluminium instead of steel. Again, all to do with, uh, with saving weight and making the whole thing lighter. But going back to these, these big air intakes, what they'll do, they'll pull the air in through the tubes up here into the air box, which you can't see, it's underneath the tank. It's a bigger air box before, sucks more air in, because when you snap the throttle open on this, you need a big chunk of air to make it all work very well because it's fuel injected and you've got instant power on tap with this. It really is very, very, well, immediate. That's the only word to describe it. The frame is different. Well, it's not different, it's the same frame, but it's, it's differently done. Uh, a lot beefier up at the headstock, a lot of strengthening up there. And again, down at the bottom end, the rear mountings there, all beefed up a bit and all a lot stronger to cope with the extra power. The dashboard is very nice though, I want to show you this. Look at this for a nice little dashboard. Just move that choke cable out of the way, the clutch cable out of the way. When I switch it on, look at that. Hey, that's funky, isn't it? Uh, analog rev counter. Digital speedo, which is brilliant. Every bike should have a digital speedo. You can see it at a glance. You imagine trying to glance down at these numbers here and read them accurately when you're traveling at speed. It's very difficult. This, dead easy. You can read it accurately to, to the, the exact mile an hour. And of course, you've got all your warning lamps and things. A couple of little trip meters on it. A clock, low fuel warning. Really, everything you need. 
Well, it hasn't got this because it's packed with technology and it's fuel injected is it hasn't got a manual choke. The choke normally would live here on the left hand grip there. You pull that on the cold morning, fire it up and then usually you'd back it off, wouldn't you? So it, it's just about running, it's not racing away so it doesn't upset the neighbours. Well, what happens on this when you turn it on? Automatic choke, cold morning, fires up perfectly. It's quite warm now, so we're only running at just almost 1,500 revs. Tickover would be about 1,000, but on a cold morning, that'll be up just over 2,000 revs, and you can't slow it down. Well, that's no problem, you might say. But if you, like, I think a lot of people will put a race can on this. Probably the first thing people will buy for the new CBI will be a race can, makes lots of noise. You fire this up on a cold morning, over 2,000 revs, a lot of noise, you're not going to be very popular with the neighbours. In the past, the CBR600 has always been praised for its all-round ability, and this new model is no exception. It's lighter than before, it's very flickable, it's quick to change direction, but it's equally at home, chugging along at 30 miles an hour in busy traffic. You don't have to thrash the pants off it to appreciate its quality. And being a new model, it's fitted with HISS, that's Honda's ignition security system, in which the key has a unique coding to help prevent theft. It does mean, however, that should you lose both of the supplied keys, you'll need to replace the whole ignition unit. Ouch. It's also got a smart water security system, which should help deter the odd dodgy character. On the road, the 600F is £6,800, and a further £400 or so will buy you the sport version. So two new models now of CBR600 to choose from, the 600F and the 600F Sport, which is it to be? Well, as I say, 400 and odd pounds will get you the Sport version. So how much extra do you get for your money? Well, on the Sport model, for the extra cash, you will actually get an extra tooth on the rear sprocket. Fantastic, that'll come in really useful. You'll also get stronger valve springs, so it allows the engine to rev slightly higher. Why you need that, I really don't know. You'll also get a racing style seat unit on the sport model, a step seat with a little pillion pad up here, actually looks quite nice. And you get a nice fancy red and black SP1 style paint job. What you don't get on the sport model for your extra cash is you don't get a centre stand. This has got a centre stand, dead useful for adjusting your chain, lubing your chain and doing your sort of routine maintenance. Why you don't get one on the sport, I really don't know, I can't answer that. If it was my money I was spending, I would stick with this with its nice dual seat, nice comfy seat, it's even got a grab rail on the back, the Sport doesn't even have a grab rail. And I'd save myself a few quid and I'd spend that on a rear hugger because it needs one to keep all the muck off the road because that is the only thing this bike is short of. The rest of the machine is absolutely spot on. Honda's flagship tourer, the ST1100 Pan-European, was launched way back in 1989, and since then it's remained virtually unchanged, apart from a few tweaks here and there. It is, of course, the chosen bike for lots of professional riders, with many reporting trouble-free riding for well in excess of 100,000 miles. This, then, is the all-new ST1300 Pan-European which Honda have just launched to the world's press here in the south of France. Existing owners were asked how they would like to see the current model improved and the feedback was for more power, less weight, an adjustable screen and an adjustable seat. The style of this new machine is not massively different but it is without doubt a much prettier bike with its smooth flowing lines and typically high level of finish. As you'd expect on any new machine, the 1261cc V4 motor is fuel injected and of course it's brand new, as is every other component on this new bike. This launch is really the first time that the world's motorcycle press has had a chance to climb all over the bike and to actually touch and feel it. And it's always good to hear the first impressions of some of the other journalists and to eavesdrop on one of the men involved with its development. What you've got here is a mammoth jump forward as regards technology and you know, it's got like 20 brake horsepower more nearly, sure. it's got fuel injection, yep. it just feels like it actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and 
um, I was saying to Adam, the best thing would have been to do, you know, or, or would be to do when you get back and you get one, is to have a run on the current one and then jump on this. Sure. You know? So, I mean, uh, uh, is it a subtle difference rather than a dramatic uh, Yeah, it is. Right, okay. yeah. I think the controls are falling easily to hand like. <laughs> Tell me, Paul, what's your view of this yeah, uh, new and improved version of the Pan European? Yeah, it just looks dead big. The it does actually, yeah. It, it does. just looks big. And more modern, but so. Yeah, we saw it in NEC yeah. last year and we saw it. Mine was up on a plinth, so it looked very grand. Sure. And we all went, wow, that's a big thing. Yeah. Where's it's the bars? Uh, it's got to be on the bars somewhere. Yeah. Well, that control doesn't fall easily to hand. It doesn't. No. It's probably under the seat, man. No, it's it's under, I mean, it should be apparent, shouldn't it? It should, yeah. yeah. It's it's what what unless this is just a. Uh, a show model or something, and it hasn't got the uh, switch. It's hardly a show model if it doesn't show you where the bloody button to adjust the screen <laughs> is, is it? Have you ridden yeah. it yet, Mark? Have no. you ridden it? No. Yeah. Ridden no. the existing one? No. Do you, oh, ride, do you ride bikes? Do you ride bikes? I do all? funny enough, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was interesting stuff, I think you'll agree, from Dave Hancock, and he probably knows more about this bike than anybody else here today. That other guy, by the way, the lad with the funny accent, that's Chris Moss. He's a motorcycle journalist, and yes, before you ask, he is on a completely different planet to everybody else, believe me. But here it is, this is the new Pan-European, beautiful looking thing, as you can see. It is a brand new bike. Now, if the old one was so good that it stayed around for 12 years, unchanged, why then suddenly change everything? Well a kind of natural progression really because of course we've got a new engine we wanted more power and all the rest of it so we've got a new motor that has to sit in a new frame so the frame has to be redesigned and of course now it's aluminium instead of the old steel frame so we've saved a bit of weight and we've upped the power as well we wanted a seat that was adjustable well this is a three position seat now it's low middle and high positions so that has to sit on a new subframe so you can see where i'm going can't you one thing leads to another and not to dismiss the old bike in any way but when you start redeveloping something and changing things and putting new things into it you finish up with a completely new bike and it is a brand new bike as i say gorgeous looking thing and there's lots and lots of technological advancements in this bike it's it's quite a high-tech thing very sophisticated piece of kit but more of all that blurb later on i think the most important thing for now is to get on it and ride it OK, well, it's first impressions time and a quick glance down the spec sheet shows that it's got more power and it's lighter. And yes, you can really tell. There's bags and bags of nice, smooth, talky power from anywhere you choose in the rev range. As for the weight, well, it certainly feels sportier than the old ST1100. Not that that matters a great deal when you're blatting along at 100 miles an hour or so, but certainly through busy villages and small towns, it's a very unintimidating bike. It doesn't feel heavy and it's very, very manageable. It inspires great confidence. Well, you're impressed, aren't you? And so you should be impressed. This is a nice piece of kit, believe me. I can tell you that it comes in two versions. This one here set in front of us is the standard version. It's the standard version because there's no ABS on it and there's no electric screen. Well, ABS, okay, personally, I can live without ABS. I'm not bothered about that. But I will say that having ridden one with an electrically adjustable screen, I would definitely go for that option. Thousand pounds is the difference in price. This on the road is going to be about 10,300. If you want ABS, the, the, the deluxe model, if you like, with ABS and electric screen, then it's going to cost you about 11,300, so it's 1,000 quid difference for that. Also, not available now on the Pan-European is TCS. That was available on the old ST1100's traction control system. That isn't on it now, and you can't have it. The reason being, Honda have asked owners, do you want TCS? What do you think of it? And they said, no, nah, we're not bothered. Not interested in that. Forget that. Leave it off. So it isn't available. As I've already said, completely new frame, aluminium frame there, which means the engine is actually mounted slightly diff well, it's not differently, but it's mounted further forward now. The engine is further forward, so there's more weight further forward, which means the seat can be mounted further forward, so the rider is further forward, which means the whole bike can be shorter. It's actually 50 millimetres, which is only, what, a couple of inches. 50 millimetres shorter wheelbase now on the whole thing. That engine, as I said, is brand new. That is a work of art. If you could see that engine, you can't, obviously, it's covered in plastic bodywork. If you could see that, it is a work of art. Not only is it shorter that way, sort of front to back, but it's more compact that way. And one of the things they've used, or one of the ideas that they've used to do that is they put the alternator in between the Vs. If you imagine there's a V engine, the alternator is sat there in the middle, and that's an idea that they have actually patented. Uh, and of course, it's helped them to keep it uh, very short, very compact, the engine. The fuel tank is new as well. That 
on the ST1100 was not a fuel tank. The fuel tank went down below and at the top it just covered up the airbox. Now the fuel sits in all of that. It is actually a proper metal fuel tank. So you could put a metallic tank bag on it as well. Slightly bigger than before, only by a litre, 29 litres, which will give it a good touring range, uh, more than equal to all of its competitors, better than I think most of them. But it doesn't all sit up at the top. 21 litres sits at the top and then 8 litres sits down below. It's kind of split in two because you don't want 29 litres of fuel up there because it's about the weight of two jerry cans and that would not be a nice bike to ride. But it's the look of the bike that's going to appeal initially to buyers. I mean, nobody's going to buy anything if they don't actually like the look of it. Think it's ugly, they won't buy it no matter how good it's supposed to be. And I think this looks really, really smart. Nice lines, nice clean lines, very futuristic looking, very modern looking. The front of it with all these V's in it, they've got, sort of got this V theme going. The fair in there down into a V, it's carried through on the sides, it's V's there. And at the back as well, the tail light also is a V shape. Now you remember the old Fireblades with the Fox Eye headlamps and oh yeah, Fox Eye headlamps. Well, I don't know who thought of that, but I've thought of a name for the tail light. I'm going to christen this, and I've not heard anyone say this. I'm going to christen that the butterfly-shaped tail light because it just looks like a butterfly, and I think it looks really smart. I'm sure you're all very impressed with my wealth of knowledge about the new Honda Pan European, but of course I've read it all in a press pack. I hadn't really got my hands on the thing before today and I've really, really only scratched the surface. There's loads of technology aboard and it gets very, very complicated, but I won't even attempt to try and tell you all about that. But earlier, I was fortunate enough to meet a man who's been involved with this bike for the last five years as a development rider. He is, of course, Dave Hancock. Um, yeah, well, the, um, the original Pan-European um, was introduced in 1991. Uh, it took us, uh, again, three years to develop that from, from the word go from about 1989 onwards. Um, really since that day we've never actually changed it at all apart from colours, it's remained the same through the ten years it's been in, in the market. Um, well we started development work on, on the new one around about five years ago and what we do initially is we do a lot of survey work and with the customers and just find out what they want, what they like, what they don't like about the current bike and then we just go into making a new one and uh, pulling out the four main things that they wanted is uh, just lighter weight, more power, um, an adjustable screen and, and an adjustable seat. So then we start development work from there and go on uh, and, it, and it just progresses through. Really what it does is it starts again in, on, a, on another 10 year cycle of, uh, of uh, the ST. And the way we develop bikes is that we actually, um, within the machine there is developments that we can do further on through the years. So actually you know, I'm sure it's going to last another 10 years and, and beyond that really. Um, it's a totally new bike, the whole thing is brand new, you know, the chassis, there isn't one part really of, uh, of the new ST that's taken from the old one, so it's a brand new machine. Well there you have it, spoken from a man who knows. Now apart from a high degree of comfort, Honda reckon they've built in a fairly high level of performance to this new machine. They say it's not dissimilar to the VFR. Well, after the break, we'll take the new pan onto some very challenging mountain roads and we'll be talking to some of the top UK bike journalists to see what they think of the new machine. There are some people that say size isn't everything and there are others that say, if you're going to have one, have a big one. Well, how about this for a big one? Honda's giant trail bike, the Varadero. The Varadero is powered by a 1000cc V-twin motor lifted straight from Honda's VTR Firestorm, so you can rightly expect it to be pretty exciting. There are, however, some engineering modifications. The Varadero uses a larger flywheel which helps to smooth out some of the lumpiness which all V-twins suffer from at low revs. It also slows the acceleration slightly. You wouldn't want to be sat this high up in the air on something which accelerates with the same force as a Honda Firestorm. Another significant change is the use of 42mm carburettors in place of the 48mm used on the VTR. But don't be fooled into thinking that the power of this motor has been completely killed off. It definitely hasn't. Still a very, very capable machine. It'll still produce 94 brake horsepower which is about a dozen or so less than a Firestorm, but it's still better than anything else in this giant trailer class. Another modification on the engine is down at the bottom, to the sump. The sump is smaller on the Varadero, got less capacity, and that's to provide more ground clearance because this thing is supposed to look like an off-road bike. Well, it does look like an off-road bike. The fact that it's completely hopeless off-road is besides the point. The problem is it's simply too big and it's far too heavy to cope with any serious terrain, any serious rough terrain. 
few potholes and cobble streets, not a problem. But if the going gets tough, don't bother trying it on one of these. There's no point having an off-road bike that you can't even pick up. So it must be good at something. Well, yes, it's excellent at sustained long distance travel, hour after hour, if you like. And really, apart from your dedicated tourers like your Pan-Europeans and your Goldwings, there's very little to touch it in the comfort stakes. The seat is superb. As good as any touring machine, you're not gonna get a sore bottom sat on that for many, many hours. And the whole riding position, really, it is, well, it's first class. The foot pegs aren't too high. They're not too far back. You're not gonna get sore aching knees position of the bars is just about spot on absolutely no strain on your arms or your wrists you can sit there all day long it's really good windscreen's fairly efficient not bad it tends to just catch the top of my helmet a little bit so I have to just squat down slightly but if I squat down slightly straight over my head don't get a headache no wind noise in my helmet really is excellent big bulbous fairing which does a reasonable sort of a job at throwing most of the wind and rain away from your body and the upper part of your legs and also, very important, when you sat this high up, visibility is excellent. So when you're touring over across the continent through all your, your nice countries and your sightseeing holidays, you can see over all the hedges on the country lanes and you can see everything, it's superb. Also superb in a busy city traffic because you're in a jam, you can see across the top of the cars, through the traffic lights, across the junctions, it really is very, very useful. So far, so good, but there is one thing that really, really does bug me and that's this thing down here a side stand and that's it a side stand we haven't got a main stand and I've said it before and I'll say it again on a bike that's capable of going for hundreds and thousands of miles and well capable of carrying some luggage you need a main stand you need to get it straight upright it's as simple as that talking about luggage no panniers are standard on this I suppose you could fit some panniers on there maybe well you could certainly fit a top box on there but you do get this rack as standard. Nice big chunky grab rails there for your pillion to hang on to. Not gonna get aching fingers. Nothing to dig into the back of your fingers there. Very, very comfy. You could strap a few bits and pieces on there. Under the seat, there's a tiny, and I mean tiny amount of storage space. I won't even bother showing it you. You get very little under there. Might just squeeze a disc lock in if you're lucky, but not much else. And I'll tell you something else that bugs me. Really having a good moan today, aren't we? But just look at this. No, I mean, I'm sorry, but I don't see the point of this. Petrol cap, there. Key in there, quite normal, nothing unusual there. Then watch this. Look at that, it comes off. Why does it come off? Why does it not flip back or hinge or something? I don't know. There's no reason for it to come off. It's just a nuisance. And not just that, but when you put it back on, you've got to push it down and then, you know, it's, it's when you've got gloves on and that at a petrol station and you're freezing cold in the middle of winter, it's just, not necessary, you just don't need problems like that. But long distance travel is where the Varadero really does excel. When the sports bike riders are stopping every couple of hours to realign their elbow and knee joints and maybe get some semblance of feeling back into their wrists, the Varadero rider can plod relentlessly on and on, hour after hour, country after country if you like. It's that comfortable, it's that effortless to ride. Fuel stops too don't have to be too frequent. A tank capacity of 25 litres will take you somewhere close to 180 miles before the warning lamp starts to flash. The Varadero really is an excellent long distance tourer. So how does it compare with the others in this class? On price, it beats the lot. At £7,300, it's cheaper than Triumph's Tiger by a couple of hundred pounds. And it beats BMW's 1100GS and their new 1150GS by well over £1,000. I make that 1-0 to the Honda. Now the motor on this Varadero is, as we've said, it's more or less the same as a VTR Firestorm. So really, need I say any more, you know how good that is. Unless, of course, you don't like V-twins. Not everybody likes a V-twin. You might prefer a Triumph Tiger. It's a 900cc triple cylinder motor. Even if it is, I think, a little bit mechanical and noisy, it's a Triumph, you might like that. You might prefer BMW's flat boxer twin in their GS, even if it does have a rather strange wobble when you're sat at the traffic lights. And if you've never noticed that, get on one, sit at the lights and just blip the throttle, just a tiny bit and you'll feel the bike go like that. It just rocks to the side. Not like that, like that. Nothing wrong with it, it's just a bit weird and a bit strange the first time you experience it. Now, giant trailies 
aren't the prettiest of bikes, I'll agree. They're not meant to be. They're built to do a purpose. They're very, very functional. No streamlined, sleek fairings and no racy paint jobs. If that's what you want, then you buy a sports bike. But they're all much of a muchness, really, the giant trailers. None of them are really much better equipped than the others. They're all pretty similar. The dashboard on this one isn't any better, isn't really any worse than anything else. We've no fuel gauge on this. We've got a fuel warning lamp down there, but we have got a, a nice little clock in the middle, which I think is great, always very useful, especially if you're going touring for hour after hour. This one has got dual CBS, Honda's combined braking system, which is very, very good. BMW's has got ABS, Triumph's Tiger. Well, that's just got reasonably good brakes. So really, you pays your money and you takes your choice. I don't think anyone is significantly better than the other. But if you want a bike that can take you to work and back every day of the week, commute through the busy city traffic with no problem at all, give you great comfort, use it at the weekends, good performance, and could even take you on holiday, then you could do a lot worse than buying one of these. And I think I know which one I'll be taking on my holidays. <laughs> The VFR 750 was a legendary, super capable all-rounder, which has now become this here VFR 800, which is a faster, more comfortable, better equipped version of the original bike. My heart sank when I found out we were testing sports tourers for this week's show, because no sports tourers test is complete without one of these, Honda's Evergreen VFR. And sadly, very few sports tourers tests are also complete without said VFR naffing off into the sunset with the top honours. In eight years as a bike journalist, I have lost count of the number of sports tourers tests I've done. And I've also lost count of the number of times the VFR has been the winner. It's just so predictable. I've ummed, I've ahed, I've lain awake at night desperately trying to find reasons for something else, anything else, to wrest the VFR's crown from its iron grasp. But whatever I do, it never works out. First up, the VTEC in that motor. It may give you two valves per cylinder low down for better torque, and it may give you four valves per cylinder higher up for better performance. It may also give the bike a power band that makes it feel faster than the previous model. But VTEC is old technology that Honda have pilfered from their car range, and there's still only 107 horsepower in there. The motor may only have 107 horsepower, but it's plenty fast enough on the road. The chassis makes this the sharpest VFR yet, and the same is true of the brakes, which bite beautifully when asked. It's easily all day comfortable, one or two up. There's a clock naturally. The mirrors are excellent, the headlight turns night into day, and there's even a centre stand. Short of the fact that this motorcycle doesn't actually ride itself, it is still one of the best bikes ever made, and it's probably the winner here. There you go, I said it. Again. Styling, 7 out of 10. Best looking VFR ever. Performance, 8 out of 10. Doesn't excel anywhere, but is good everywhere. Practicality, nine out of 10. It's well made, it's built to last, and as well as that, it'll handle just about anything you want to do. Value, eight out of 10. Just a shade under eight grand, it's not a cheap motorcycle, but you do get a lot of bike for your money. 